let me just briefly introduce Chen Chen. Um, so Chen Chen Gu is an assistant professor of computer science at UCSD. Uh, it's our pleasure to have him here today. Um, his current research is mostly focusing on developing and analyzing non-convex optimization algorithm for machine learning and building theoretical foundations of deep learning. He received his PhD degree in computer science from UIUC at 2014 and is a recipient of various awards, including NSF, Career Awards, Simons Berkeley Research Fellowship, and et cetera. Uh, so without further ado, um, Chen Chen, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Yan, for inviting me. And uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to virtually uh, visit the uh, your institute and hope I can uh, visit in person uh, in the near future. So uh, yeah, OK, yeah, I just uh, saw uh, Misha on the job meeting. Yeah, hi, Misha. So uh, OK, so let me start. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the implicit bias of stochastic gradient descent uh, with moderate learning rate. So this is a joint work based on uh, it is based on joint work with my uh, collaborators, Jingfeng Wu and uh, Fova uh, Braveman. Uh, both of them are from Johns Hopkins University and my own PhD student at uh, at UCLA. Uh, so this uh, work has been uh, accepted at uh, ICLEAR 2021. So if you are interested, you can uh, refer to the, the paper uh, for more details. So the uh, basic background of this work is uh, uh, deep learning, uh, the resurgence of deep learning. So deep learning has achieved a lot of success uh, in different applications. And one of the key features uh, in deep learning is called uh, over parameterization. So which means uh, in many like modern neural networks, the number of parameters is uh, much larger than the number of training examples. And uh, this is uh, also true uh, for, for example, image uh, recognition. Uh, here is a, a like a illustration of the size of the different neural networks and uh, their uh, performance uh, on the image net uh, image classification task. So the x axis uh, is uh, the number of operations uh, because uh, uh, for many neural networks they are CN, so it's a, a more realistic use the number of operations to measure the size uh, of the, uh, the the neural network. And then the y axis is a top one accuracy. Uh, so on this data set, people often use top one and top five accuracy to measure the performance. And you can see a very clear pattern that usually the larger the network, uh, the better the performance uh, will be. Uh, so this is a very uh, surprising uh, phenomenon because according to uh, traditional uh, statistical machine learning uh, wisdom, uh, you know, uh, in order to get a good generalization performance, we need to uh, control the complexity of the model. Uh, to avoid overfitting. And however, in deep learning, it seems that uh, deep learning, uh, overfitting is not a big issue. You can have a very uh, big uh, model uh, with a lot of uh, model parameters, and you can still achieve uh, reasonably good uh, generalization performance on the test data set or foundation data set. So this is uh, uh, one of the very uh, interesting uh, phenomenon in deep learning. And because the model is over parameterized, uh, so there's a good reason to believe that uh, you can find uh, many or potentially infinite number of models uh, such that uh, uh, the training error will be small or even equal to zero. Okay, so if you are considering uh, classification problems, you can make the training loss very, very small so that every training data point can be correctly classified. In that case, you will receive uh, zero training error. However, uh, if you make the training error equal to zero, uh, what would the test error look like, right? So uh, according to traditional wisdom of machine learning, if you have a zero training error, you probably will have a, a large test error because you overfit the training data, you interpolate the training data, you may get a very uh, bad generalization performance. Uh, but in deep learning, this is not the case. Even if you can make the training error very small or exactly equal to zero, you can still uh, obtain very small test error. Okay, so this is a, a very uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, observations in deep learning. And uh, here's a paper, so they carried out some experiments. So they train uh, two layer uh, new networks uh, where the width of the new networks is gradually increased. So the x axis here is the width of the new network. And the y axis is the error on the uh, uh, test and training data set. Okay. So for the MNIST data set, you can see that when you increase the width of the new network, 
the training error can be decreased to zero uh, very quickly uh, on the small amnesia data set. But uh, even the training error becomes zero, uh, the test error can still uh, be very small. And uh, even if you keep increasing the width of your network, the training error will stay at zero and the test error can still be uh, further decreased when you increase the width of your network. And uh, what is more interesting is uh, uh, for HGD, uh, if you do, for example, early stopping, or if you do regularization, uh, which is uh, also called the weight decay in deep learning, or if you just train HGD until it uh, uh, converge. So for all three uh, different uh, uh, configurations of HGD, they achieve a very uh, similar uh, test error, even though on the amnist uh, data side, uh, the test error with weight decay is uh, uh, slightly uh, smaller. And on the CIVA 10 data set, you can observe a similar uh, phenomenon. And uh, the main difference is on this data set, uh, no matter you are doing weighted decay or not, HGD uh, can achieve uh, uh, basically very uh, similar and very uh, uh, good uh, error on the CIVA 10 data set. Okay. So from this observation, uh, we, it looks like uh, HGD may exhibit some uh, implicit bias that uh, tend to find a model with a lower complexity. And uh, this is the key motivation of a line of research uh, in, the uh, in the literature, uh, which aims to uh, study the implicit bias or implicit regularization uh, for uh, different optimization algorithms, including gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent. Okay, so I will walk you through a few of the uh, classical results in uh, about the implicit bias of gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent, because of which will uh, lay out the, uh, the most uh, relevant background for our work. So for linear regression, uh, if you use gradient descent or gradient flow uh, to, uh, to solve the linear regression problem, if you initialize gradient descent or gradient flow at the origin, you will find the minimum norm solution uh, of the empirical risk, okay? So this is some, uh, uh, old actually result, although uh, it uh, is reasonably, uh, it is a recently studied, uh, uh, for example, by this work uh, as a, a special case because they consider even more general uh, setting where the uh, optimizing geometry uh, may, pick a, may play a central role in, in the analysis for different uh, uh, geometry, you may have different uh, uh, implicit uh, bias. So for uh, optimization for gradient descent in the Euclidean space, uh, this basically converted to the minimum norm solution uh, subject to this equality constraint. So in other words, among all those uh, linear predictors that will uh, interpolate the training data, gradient descent will convert it to the specific one, uh, which has the smallest uh, L2 norm. So this is uh, the first uh, result about the implicit bias uh, for linear regression. And for classification problems, uh, we can also uh, derive some kind of implicit bias result. So a couple of papers uh, probably uh, around the same time, they proved that gradient descent and gradient flow uh, with arbitrary interestation uh, will find, will convert to the maximum margin uh, classifier on separable data, okay? So there are several uh, key uh, messages here. So first of all, the step size need to be very small, uh, but the interaction can be arbitrary. It's different from the case of linear regression. Uh, we don't require uh, uh, the interaction is at the origin. So we can allow arbitrary interaction uh, for logistic regression. Uh, and uh, the implicit bias is uh, instead of a, a minimum norm, uh, uh, this interpreter, uh, it will be a maximum margin classified which is defined as a, a minimum uh, L2 norm subject to this hard margin constraint over the uh, training data, okay? So here's some uh, experimental results provided uh, in this paper. So x-axis is the number of iterations and y-axis is the angle uh, between the uh, iterate and the uh, weight of the maximum margin uh, classified. So you can see that the angle uh, is decreasing uh, very uh, quickly. So when the number of equations, number of iterations go to, for example, 10 to six, the angle is almost uh, zero. And there's another quantity called a margin gap, uh, which is basically the difference between the normalized uh, weight vector 
and the normalized uh, maximum margin uh, uh, classified. So this distance will also be uh, decreased very quickly uh, when uh, gradient descent uh, uh, proceed. Okay, so uh, this is another uh, interesting result. And uh, there are also, uh, so feel free to, in sure. If you don't mind, uh, but when you say quickly, it looks very slowly, no, to me, the number of iteration is actually very large to get the small uh, gap, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the, actually, the, the yeah, actually, the convergence in terms of the uh, the the angle actually is one over log t. Yeah, it is a, not a. I, I shouldn't say it's quickly. I should say well, eventually, slowly. Yeah, to <laughs> to zero because this really is one over log t or one of uh, uh, log log t. Uh, so there are uh, slightly different results uh, proved in these several papers. Yeah, the convergence rate is uh, uh, is actually slower than uh, one over square root of t. Uh, which is a typical uh, convergence uh, in the uh, in in the parameter uh, space. Yeah. So, so actually, uh, I mean, uh, one more comment. It, it it sort of suggests that in practice it doesn't really happen, right? Because nobody can run it for that long. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's a good point, and that's exactly I think when we uh, talk about the implicit bias of uh, uh, gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent, we should also consider. Uh, the early stopping uh, case, which is exactly one of the uh, scenario we uh, studied in our paper. Yeah, so our result actually uh, is only uh, it's the meaningful uh, will do early stopping. If they don't do early stopping, then probably uh, there's a uh, no, uh, difference. You, you will see uh, the detail of our result when I, uh, after I present it. But it's an interesting it's distinction. Time Sorry, time I'm time I interrupting again. again. But it's an interesting distinction between the square loss, where actually you converge exponential rate, and uh, the, the, the this type of uh, logistic regress, logistic loss, where you converge at a log rate. It's extremely different, right, in terms of the speed of convergence. Uh, yes, uh, uh, just is a month. Uh, decreasing loss in order to make the uh, chain arrow exactly uh, the, uh, the norm of the the, the weight to go to infinity that will uh, uh, take uh, uh, a lot a lot longer time than because for uh, square loss it's a linear rate of convergence uh, even on yeah even on the slope data is not a uh, linear rate of convergence. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Then uh, there are also uh, some uh, recent work. They try to extend the implicit bias uh, result of gradient descent and the gradient flow, the case gradient descent. For instance, for linear regression, uh, there's a recent paper by Adi et al. So they show that for sufficiently small learning rate, uh, SGD can be described by some uh, so-called stochastic gradient flow. And uh, the behavior of this uh, uh, continuous time uh, dynamic at the time t is uh, uh, nearly equivalent to the solution of a rigid regression uh, with a uh, regularization parameter equal to uh, one over t. Okay, so uh, actually this is uh, uh, can be seen as a generalization of uh, the, uh, the, gradient of, uh, the result of gradient flow uh, with early stopping uh, to stochastic gradient flow uh, with uh, early stopping. Uh, for logistic regression, uh, uh, there's also a special result, uh, which uh, shows that uh, HGD can find a max margin classify on the separable data, but uh, the uh, condition is that the learning rate need to be very, very uh, small. So as I will explain uh, later, actually this result uh, uh, is important, but it's not uh, uh, that surprising. Because when the learning rate is very, very small, the behavior of uh, 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 gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent uh, will be very uh, similar to each other. But uh, in practice, uh, people never use very, very small uh, step size for stochastic gradient descent. That's why uh, we think uh, it's important to study stochastic gradient descent with moderate uh, learning rate, because this is the regime uh, uh, where deep learning is uh, so successful. The regime that uh, uh, step size is so small that HGD and GD or even group four, these three are 
almost the same that regime uh, is a, a regime for a theoretical interest, but uh, uh, it's probably not a regime of uh, broad uh, practical interest. Okay, so as I mentioned, the uh, one uh, limitation is uh, all previous work on the implicit bias uh, for GD, SGD uh, is limited to very small step size or even infinite, infinite, uh, uh, infinite uh, decimal step size uh, for, such as uh, gradient flow. Okay, another uh, thing that uh, uh, people observed in practice is uh, uh, when you apply gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent onto the same uh, uh, deep learning problems, they often give you very uh, different generalization performance. Okay, but uh, existing uh, work on implicit bias of GD and SGD because they are limited to a very small step size regime. In that regime, you cannot differentiate uh, GD and SGD. So our second goal is uh, uh, if we can somehow differentiate GD and SGD uh, in certain uh, regime uh, to explain the uh, observations uh, of uh, different behaviors, different generalization behaviors uh, caused by these two uh, algorithms. Okay. So uh, this uh, raises uh, uh, two questions. The first question is how to uh, characterize the implicit bias of HGD uh, when using uh, moderate learning rate, because this is a question uh, of both uh, practical and theoretical interest. The second question is uh, how does the implicit bias of, uh, for example, HGD uh, affect the generalization performance? Okay. Or how does the implicit bias of HGD and the GD uh, differentiate the uh, generalization performance of these two uh, algorithms. Okay, so this is the two uh, questions we want to uh, answer uh, in, in our work. Okay. Although we cannot fully answer uh, these two questions in the most uh, general uh, setting, but we can find some uh, interesting uh, learning problems. Uh, for those learning problems, we can uh, partially answer these two questions uh, with some uh, very uh, interesting uh, result. Okay, so uh, before I uh, move on, do you have any questions? Because uh, in the following, I will uh, uh, dive into the uh, the setup of our own uh, work. All right. Okay. So feel free to uh, interrupt me if you uh, have any questions. So this is the practical uh, implementation of SGD. So this result is taken from this uh, seminal work uh, on uh, ResNet. Okay, so this is very uh, uh, impactful uh, work. So in this paper, they chain uh, uh, ResNet 18 and the ResNet 34, uh, two different ResNet on the CIVA 10 uh, image data set. They use initial learning rate 0.1, and then they do uh, this kind of uh, learning rate decay, uh, we, they divide the learning rate by 10 when the uh, training arrow uh, becomes a uh, plateau, okay? So you can see that uh, roughly they do uh, this kind of learning rate decay every like uh, 15 uh, epochs. So for both, uh, so for both uh, ResNet 18 and uh, ResNet 34, uh, you can, they plot the training arrow uh, and the validation arrow uh, you can see that uh, uh, HGD can uh, reduce the training arrow and the validation arrow uh, very uh, effectively if you do uh, learning rate decay. And uh, uh, this is a, a very typical uh, plot of HGD training arrow test arrow uh, in those uh, uh, in different deep learning papers, including uh, some of my own papers. So if you uh, do the uh, very standard uh, uh, routine, you will get this kind of uh, uh, plot. But uh, the key uh, message uh, from this uh, plot is uh, the learning rate is uh, like a 0 0.1, it's uh, like a big O1 learning rate, it's a constant learning rate instead of uh, like a diminishing or infinite uh, decimal learning rate. So this is uh, the key uh, difference between the practice uh, of HGD and uh, uh, the uh, work on the implicit bias of HGD. And we also uh, did some uh, experimental comparison between SGD and GD. The reason why we want to do this experiment is because in practice, no one uses GD to uh, train a new network. So in order to illustrate 
uh, but the reason actually is about VS because if you are using GD to uh, train a new network, you probably wouldn't get very good uh, generalization performance. But we still uh, want to uh, uh, reiterate uh, this uh, uh, difference. So uh, that's why we uh, carried out this experiment. So we train a ResNet 18 uh, new network uh, using SGD and GD on the CIVA 10 data set. And we didn't do weighted K, we didn't do uh, data augmentation because we want to uh, do a very uh, controlled like experiment uh, just to exclude other uh, potential uh, factors that may affect uh, the, the, the conclusion of our, uh, so we turn off with decay, we turn off data augmentation, but I would say in practice with decay and data augmentation are very well used and it can uh, help uh, significantly in many uh, situations. So uh, our experiment shows that uh, uh, for stochastic gradient descent with a small learning rate and for gradient descent with both a small and a moderate learning rate. So all these three algorithms, so basically this uh, uh, orange line, this uh, uh, light blue line, and this uh, uh, blue line, actually these three, uh, they're uh, in terms of the, the trajectory, actually they are very close to each other. Okay. So after 6,000 uh, or 8,000 8, iteration, you can see that these three lines, they almost uh, overlapped with each other. So it's around like 82% uh, uh, test accuracy. For SGE with a moderate uh, learning rate, okay, with a large learning rate, uh, you can see that it can achieve uh, significantly better uh, test accuracy is uh, improved by 1%. Uh, on CIVA 10, they said actually 1% is, uh, is, a is considered as a significant improvement. Okay, so you can see that uh, uh, indeed, uh, HGD, uh, it, is, uh, it matters, the learning rate matters for HGD uh, between a small learning rate and a moderate uh, learning rate. For GD, uh, no matter you are using small learning rate or moderate learning rate, actually, uh, the result uh, uh, does not uh, change uh, very significantly. Okay, so this uh, further uh, provides some empirical uh, uh, items about uh, the different uh, distinguishing or differentiation uh, between uh, HGD and GD uh, in the uh, moderate uh, learning rate regime. Okay. okay. Now uh, I have talked about the, uh, a lot about the gradient descent and the stochastic gradient descent, but I haven't uh, uh, tells you the specific form. Uh, so just uh, uh, in case uh, some of you are not familiar uh, with the mathematical uh, form of gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent, uh, let me uh, define them uh, formally uh, on this slide. So we want to uh, minimize some objective function LS of W. So W is an automatic variable, uh, which is in the form of a finite sum, finite average, okay, of LI of W. So here each LI can be seen as, uh, for example, the loss function associated with the I's uh, training data point in the training uh, data set. Okay. So this is a uh, uh, called empirical uh, risk minimization problems if uh, uh, the Right hand side is the, for example, the average of the loss uh, defined on the uh, training data set. And we can use gradient descent to uh, solve this minimization problem. So it's an iterative algorithm uh, starting from W0. Uh, every iteration we just uh, uh, take, we just uh, uh, move around the negative uh, direction of, uh, of the gradient, okay, uh, by some uh, step size eta, or uh, in deep learning people call it the learning rate uh, eta. Uh, for HGD, uh, we, instead of using the full gradient, using the gradient of the uh, entire loss function, we are using uh, the so-called stochastic gradient. So here is an example of a mini batch stochastic gradient. So we sample uh, batch BT, uh, which is uh, its size equal to little b. So there are, for example, b uh, training data points uh, that are sampled uh, ID uh, with receiver. Uh, with replacement from the training data set. And then we just calculate uh, the, the, the sum of the, the, the average of the stochastic gradient over this uh, B uh, training data point. And uh, then uh, we also use uh, some step size uh, to uh, determine the, the increment uh, we want to uh, move along the uh, negative direction of the stochastic gradient. Okay, uh, 
And in order to uh, build some connections between gradient descent and the stochastic gradient descent, uh, we can uh, write the upper rule of stochastic gradient descent in this way. Okay, so it basically just um, uh, minus and then plus uh, the, the full gradient. Okay, so you, this term and this term can be canceled out. But the, the reason why I did it this way because we want to make this part uh, identical to the gradient descent update rule. And then this part, uh, which is the difference between the stochastic gradient and the full gradient, uh, we can consider it as the noise uh, caused by the stochastic gradient. Okay. And this noise is scaled by the learning rate eta. Okay. And uh, since the stochastic gradient is unbiased as made of the full gradient, so it's easy to see that uh, if we consider this as a noise, then, then this noise will have uh, zero mean. Because if you take expectation, uh, conditional expectation, conditional on WT, then this uh, term will uh, equal to zero. Okay, so this is a zero mean noise. And uh, uh, when the learning rate is small, actually gradient descent and the uh, stochastic gradient descent, uh, they can uh, be equivalent to each other uh, through the following argument. Okay, so for gradient descent, when the learning rate goes to, uh, for example, zero, uh, we can use gradient flow, which is an ODE, to approximate uh, the gradient, the discrete time uh, gradient descent. Uh, so when the learning rate is small, okay. And actually from gradient flow, if you are doing the OLA discretization, uh, then you can get a gradient descent. Okay, so here DT, uh, roughly speaking, you can uh, think of DT as uh, the eta, as the, uh, the, the, uh, the step size. Okay, and for stochastic gradient descent, uh, we can do, uh, we can use a stochastic modified equation, which uh, was proposed in this uh, paper. So this is a very uh, uh, nice, uh, uh, PDE because uh, uh, it, it, in my opinion, it's a, it's a very uh, uh, good uh, model to uh, model the stochastic gradient descent. So when DT, uh, so basically uh, we can use this stochastic modified uh, equation. So this is a different from uh, Langevin van dynamics, I would say. Because sometimes the people say I would use a Langevin van dynamic to approximate uh, SGD, uh, which uh, in my opinion is not <laughs> correct. It's not uh, well grounded. Uh, the difference between this and uh, the line one dynamic is uh, this additional uh, square root of the eta uh, factor. So here, eta actually is, is the step size. So that's why it's called the stochastic modified equation. It's not a uh, line one dynamics. And this dBT is the Brownian motion. And uh, this uh, sigma of uh, WT uh, is the covariance uh, matrix of the stochastic gradient. Okay. However, and uh, then when uh, eta, uh, for example, go to zero, when the step size becomes smaller and smaller, this term will uh, vanish, okay? The reason is that there's a square root of the eta factor here, okay? So when eta go to zero, then this term uh, appear. In that case, this stochastic uh, modified equation uh, will uh, be identical to gradient flow, okay? Because uh, this term is gone, then the remaining uh, term on the right-hand side uh, will be the same as the remaining uh, will be the same as the turn in the gradient uh, flow. Okay, so this justify why when the learning rate is very very small or go to uh, zero, uh, gradient descent and uh, stochastic gradient descent will behave uh, very similar to each other. Or in a limiting case, they will be the same thing. Okay, so that's why uh, in a previous uh, slide I comment that if you can prove uh, the implicit bias of gradient flow then uh, it's not that difficult to prove the implicit bias of a stochastic gradient descent if you restrict yourself uh, to the regime where the length rate is a very, very small or, or even a uh step size uh, setting. Okay. However, in practice, the learning rate is not small. If the learning rate is not small, then uh, we cannot uh, use, we cannot build the equivalence between SGD and GD. Uh, just using the uh, same uh, language, the stochastic modified equation. So when uh, the step size is not small, even using the stochastic modified equation to approximate SGD is not well uh, justified, okay? If the learning rate is not that small. If, for example, if learning rate equal to 0.1, uh, which is the learning rate we just uh, see, uh, we just saw in the experiment of uh, uh, CIFAR-10 uh, in the data side, uh, 
that uh, in that setting, uh, you cannot use a stochastic modifier equation to approximate HGD. And also, when the learning rate is not small, uh, this turn, the Brownian motion turn, uh, because this is square root of eta, is still a constant order turn, it's not uh, like a little o one turn, so you cannot uh, uh, throw it away. So in that case, uh, the previous equivalence between HGD and GD cannot be uh, established anymore. Okay. So this is the reason why in the moderate learning rate uh, setting, the behavior of uh, SGD and GD should be different. And we should uh, uh, characterize their uh, behavior uh, separately uh, rather than uh, uh, treat them uh, as the same state. Okay. Now uh, let's consider the non-small learning rate uh, regime or we call it the moderate learning rate regime. So this is an object function uh, we want to uh, minimize, okay? So remember that for each component function ALI, uh, in the uh, empirical risk minimization setting is associated with the IT training point in the data site, right? So they may have a different smoothness parameter because different uh, data points have, may have different lines of the uh, input XI. And also uh, for some uh, loss functions such as logistic loss, uh, used in logistic regression. This also depends on W, okay? For linear regression, actually, this uh, uh, LI of W, if you uh, take the hashing of this, uh, it's just a rank one matrix XI, XI channels. It does not depend on W. But for logistic regression or for deep learning, uh, it, also have a, uh, it also has an additional dependence on W, okay? And on the left-hand side, this is the average the function. So the smoothness parameter is no longer the smoothness parameter of each individual uh, loss function. It should be uh, something uh, in the average uh, sense rather than uh, the smoothness parameter for each individual uh, loss function, okay? And uh, because of this observation, actually you can find some uh, so-called critical learning rate or some like a threshold. When the uh, learning rate is greater than this uh, uh, critical learning rate, the algorithm, for example, gradient descent will not converge, okay? For instance, starting from here uh, for this problem, so this is a quadratic uh, uh, programming, and uh, uh, the gradient update rule actually can be uh, written in this way, uh, where uh, it looks like a, like a power uh, method, power, the update uh, uh, of power uh, method, okay? So if a size size is greater than or equal to two divided by the smoothness parameter of this function, uh, which is uh, the maximum eigenvalue H, or which is also the same as the spectral norm of H because H is a, a positive sign definite uh, matrix, okay? In this case, uh, the algorithm will diverge. And only when the step size is less than uh, two divided by the smoothness parameter, the algorithm will uh, converge. Okay, the algorithm will converge. Okay, so, uh, so that's why uh, in our following discussion, we will first uh, uh, define the, the moderate learning rate as a learning rate that is uh, less than uh, two divided by the smoothness parameter of the entire uh, object function. Okay, we, uh, we restrict ourselves in this setting because uh, otherwise the algorithm uh, will default, then there's uh, uh, no point to, uh, to study SGD and GD. Uh, and also there's no way to, uh, to differentiate them. Okay, and we will start with uh, this uh, moderate learning rate, uh, initial learning rate, and then we will do length of decay, okay. And the key intuition uh, for SGD with moderate uh, initial learning rate is at uh, the first phase, okay, in the first phase, uh, because the learning rate is large, in that case, actually we are able to optimize those component functions with a small uh, smoothness parameter. Okay, so remember that if this learning rate is uh, relatively large at beginning, then we are able to, uh, if your eta times, for example, uh, some eigen, uh, uh, the eigen, uh, the the for example eigen of h. So if uh, eta is large, then you are able to uh, minimize uh, some component function with a small uh, smoothness parameter. And after you uh, do learning with a decay. Okay, so this e card becomes smaller and smaller if you do learning rate decay. Then uh, what uh, you, you can optimize actually will be those components uh, with large uh, smoothness parameter. Okay, so this is just uh, some 
uh, intuition, intuitive idea. So I will make it uh, uh, more formal uh, in the next uh, few slides. Okay, so to give you a more concrete example, let's consider a two-dimensional example. So this example is uh, like a very, a very artificial, but uh, it gives you a lot of insight. Okay, so let's define uh, two uh, loss functions, L1 of W and L2 of W. Okay, so each of them uh, is a quadratic function. Uh, so L1 of W is a parameterized by H1. So H1 is a high thing. This high thing is a diagonal matrix. The first uh, uh, element is a two times kappa. The second element equal to zero. Okay. And for H2, uh, it's also a diagonal uh, uh, matrix. The first element equal to zero, the second element equal to two. Okay. And uh, remember that the, the entire object function is the average of L1 and L2. So we write it as LS. So if you do averaging, actually, uh, you average and you get H. So H is a, a diagonal matrix. Uh, the first element equal to kappa because this is a two kappa plus zero divided by two, you get a kappa. The second element equal to one because uh, uh, you do the calculation zero plus two divided by two, you get one. Okay. So this is a, a example. And we assume kappa is greater than two. Okay. So in other words, uh, uh, kappa will, uh, will be large enough. The first element of H will be larger than the second element of A, okay? And let's uh, compare gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent in the uh, small learning rate uh, regime uh, first. For small learning rate, uh, if the eta step size is less than or equal to, for example, 0 0.1 divided by kappa, okay? So in this case, can, uh, uh, you know what's first of all. That's a, a first a figure out the critical learning rate. The critical learning rate will be uh, two divided by uh, kappa, right? Two divided by the smoothing parameter. So this uh, small learning rate regime gradient descent will converge. Okay, will converge, and it will converge uh, the uh, uh, small eigenvalue direction. The reason is uh, when the step size uh, is within the uh, the critical uh, linear rate uh, regime. Uh, when you use gradient descent to optimize, uh, to solve these uh, uh, problems, the, you will first uh, 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 optimize around the uh, uh, large eigenvalue direction. Because uh, remember that just keep this in. Okay, so when uh, eta uh, is uh, small enough. This learning rate is uh, small enough. And uh, when the smoothing parameter is large, in that case, eta times the smoothing parameter will uh, be closer to one. And then one and 90 minus this matrix will be closer, uh, will be small. So in that case, the larger eigenvalue direction will be exactly uh, optimized. Okay, so that's why uh, from starting from the initial gradient descent will first go along this direction because this direction is the minor axis of this yield result, which corresponds to larger eigenvalue direction. And after it uh, optimizes the uh, object function along the larger eigenvalue direction, then it will optimize uh, the small eigenvalue direction. Okay, so actually uh, the optimization along both directions happen at the same time, but uh, the optimization along the larger eigenvalue direction, uh, it will progress much faster. At the beginning, uh, it will uh, go around this direction. And uh, in the later stage, the gradient descent will convert to the global minimum, which is uh, the origin of this uh, uh, two dimensional plane uh, along the small eigenvalue direction. And for stochastic gradient descent, you can, for this component and this component, if you uh, figure out uh, the, if, uh, the, the learning rate is a two divided by kappa, so this is two divided by two. So both of them, uh, uh, for in this, uh, so this learning rate actually for in the effective learning rate for I think both H1, uh, A1, and two. so that's why for stochastic gradient it can also uh, convert uh, almost like, uh, along the same trajectory as gradient descent. Okay, but uh, the interesting thing actually happens in the moderate uh, learning rate regime. Okay, so if you uh, start with a learning rate equal to 1.1 divided by kappa, okay. You can see that uh, for this kind of uh, learning rate, okay, 
uh, for gradient descent, uh, actually, uh, there's no uh, big difference because uh, uh, for gradient descent, the critical learning uh, rate is uh, two divided by kappa. So uh, this one is smaller than two divided by kappa. So gradient descent will still uh, follow this kind of trajectory. But uh, since the learning rate is larger, so there's an overshoot. So starting from the same issue point, there's an overshoot to here. And then it will convert along this uh, small eigenvalue direction. Okay, but for uh, stochastic gradient descent, uh, the converging pattern or converging uh, trajectory will be uh, radically different. Because uh, at the beginning, if the learning rate is 1.1 .1 divided by kappa, in this case, only uh, L2 will be effectively uh, uh, optimized uh, first. Okay, because this learning rate is large, then uh, only the uh, component function with a small uh, smooth parameter uh, will be effectively uh, optimized. So at the beginning, so HD will convert along uh, this direction, which is uh, the direction of the major axis of this ellipsoid. Okay. And uh, after HD uh, optimize the uh, the component function along the uh, with a, a small uh, smooth parameter. After the linear rate decay, okay, then HGD will be able to optimize those component function with a large uh, smoothing parameter. So this one, okay. And when HGD start to optimize this component function, it will converge along this direction because this direction uh, uh, corresponds to the uh, large smoothing parameter. Okay. So uh, as you can see, for moderate learning rate, starting from the same initial point, GD will follow this tra trajectory and eventually converge to the global minimum around the uh, small uh, eigenvalue direction. But SGD will follow a different trajectory and eventually converge to the global minimum along the large eigenvalue direction. Okay, so from this uh, 2D example, uh, you, you, uh, you can pretty get uh, the, the key idea of our uh, result, well, but this is a very special uh, case. Okay, and uh, in order to uh, make this uh, argument more general and uh, 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 meaningful, so we consider high dimensional linear regression problem. Uh, so this is the problem set up. Okay, so we generate the data duration uh, from uh, this one. So we first generate the direction of the data, and then we generate the lens of the data. So remember that uh, the direction of the data is uh, uh, uniformly diffused over the sphere, okay? And the lens of the data is uniformly over this zero interval. This data actually is uh, atropic uh, diffusion. This data duration is atropic. That means the covariance matrix is uh, proportional to an identity matrix. And after we generate the data, we generate a label, the response, which is a W star times X. Okay, so the population risk uh, by definition actually is a proportional to W minus W star to norm square because the covariance matrix uh, is proportional to the identity. And given the chain data X1, Y1, Xn, Yn, uh, we write the design matrix as X1, X. N, so each column is a, a, a data point. So it's a little bit uh, different from the convention in, in, in statistics, okay? Uh, but but the, 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 uh, it makes no difference. Okay. And the empirical risk uh, is just uh, uh, written uh, in this way, okay? So based on this data diffusion assumption and uh, easily prove that uh, uh, in the over parameter setting where the dimension D is much larger than the training sample uh, size, then the training data are uh, approximately uh, orthogonal, okay? So this is not uh, to prove. And uh, we also define some quantities, the lambda i to denote the length of each training data point, okay? And we sort lambda i uh, in a, a descending order, okay? Sort the training data point in a, a descending order in terms of the length. And we also uh, uh, define the, eigenvalue and eigenvectors of the sample covariance matrix. So the eigenvalue is R1 to Rn in a descending order and the corresponding eigenvectors V1 to Vn, okay. And we also define two projection operators. P is uh, the projection operator onto the column space of X 
and p orthogonal is uh, just the projection onto the complement of the, the column space of x. Okay, so with this uh, notation, uh, we are able to uh, present uh, several main risks. So the first uh, statement is not a, a big deal. So basically, it says uh, this uh, training loss has a number of global minimum, uh, and the global minimum value uh, equal to zero. Uh, the second uh, point is uh, both gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent they will perform in the uh, uh, space. So this is a parameter space where uh, W and the initialization of the W. So they are the same in the uh, complementary uh, subspace uh, of the uh, color space of X. Okay, so this is uh, also uh, very simple to uh, understand. And uh, there's only one global minimum in this parameter space, which is the one closest to W0, okay? So remember that uh, if W0 equal to zero, then uh, this uh, one unique global minimum actually is the minimum norm solution in this uh, uh, subspace. Uh, but uh, we don't need to uh, require W0 uh, to be a zero vector. So then it will be the minimum distance solution, which is the one which uh, that is closest to W0. So this theorem uh, is not uh, uh, very surprising. It's just uh, uh, lay out the, the, the space uh, that all the uh, analysis will be uh, carried out, where all analysis will be carried out. Okay. So the next theorem is about the small learning rate uh, regime. So if the learning rate is uh, like a small or one, okay, in this learning rate regime, both HGD and GD Okay, they will converge around the smallest eigenvalue of the uh, sample covariance matrix. Okay, so remember that we need to project this uh, difference uh, onto the column space of X. Okay, and this Vn is the smallest eigenvalue direction of the sample covariance matrix. And the next result is even more uh, interesting. So for in the uh, moderate learning rate regime, okay, for stochastic gradient descent, if eta is between, for example, two divided by lambda one and two divided by lambda two. So remember that lambda one is the length of the, uh, the first chain layer point, lambda two is the uh, length of the second chain layer point. But uh, uh, we sort the chain layer point uh, in, a, uh, in terms of the length in a descending order, okay. So this is a valid interval. So if a little bit is uh, uh, within this interval, then SGD, okay, well, the difference between SGD and the W star, the, the, the ground truth uh, W star, uh, the output of SGD will converge to the largest eigenvalue of the, uh, eigenvalue, uh, largest eigenvector of the uh, sample covariance matrix, okay. But for gradient descent, when the step says for in this uh, very big interval is a two n divided by lambda one, okay, the gradient descent output, and and it's a difference uh, and it's a distance from W star, so this will converge to the uh, smallest eigenvalue direction of the sum of covariance matrix. So know that this interval actually belongs to this interval. So even we present the result uh, for the uh, learning rate in a much larger. Uh, in a much wider range, but remember that this uh, actually is a, a sub interval of this one. Okay, so in other words, you can just uh, uh, restrict uh, uh, yourself to this interval, and when you restrict yourself to this interval, you can see that uh, SGD and GD they can be uh, differentiated uh, in terms of the convergence direction uh, in the final uh, stage. So uh, here's some uh, proof idea. Uh, in the intro of time, I will just uh, uh, quickly uh, go over it. So for gradient design, when you write down the gradient update rule, you can uh, write it uh, uh, in this way, which is similar to a uh, power method. So the analysis actually uh, is just like uh, uh, convergence uh, around different uh, eigen uh, directions of this uh, uh, matrix. So I assume it is uh, 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 relatively easy. But for stochastic gradient descent, okay, that's considered one epoch stochastic gradient descent. So in other words, WT plus one and WT are the iterate at the beginning and also at the end of one epoch. So one epoch means you uh, will uh, go over each uh, chain data point 
uh, in one uh, path, okay. And here pi i is the uh, permutation function. Uh, that's assumed uh, in each epoch, we will shuffle the uh, train data uh, set and then uh, for each uh, data point, we will uh, use it once to calculate the sky screen. Okay, so th because this is uh, just some uh, uh, proof idea, so we can simplify it, but in the most general setting, we don't need to uh, uh, do this kind of uh, uh, epoch based analysis. This uh, is a uh, solely uh, for the uh, sake of simplicity. Okay. And uh, the key is uh, if this product uh, matrix behaves the same as uh, this matrix, because this matrix is the matrix that governs the, the dynamic of gradient descent. So if this matrix uh, plays the essentially the same, for example, effect as this matrix, then HGD and GD will be uh, equivalent or will be similar. Otherwise, they will be different, okay? So first of all, you can see that for each Xi, if eta, the step side times Xi, Xi transpose spectral norm is greater than two, okay? Then uh, for this kind of uh, large norm, it will be uh, effectively uh, optimized because it will uh, diverge, okay? And uh, another thing uh, I want to mention is if you choose step size to be very small and you can expand this product term, the sales order term is identity. The first order term in eta is uh, just a eta times the summation of uh, uh, this uh, rank one matrix, uh, which will be uh, identical eta times xx transpose. And then the remaining term is uh, eta square, eta cubic, or eta high order term in eta. If eta is uh, uh, very small, then the dominant term will be the sales order term and the first order term, which is exactly this identity minus eta xx transpose. So in that case, uh, you can also argue that uh, HGD and GD uh, behaving uh, very similar to each other. But uh, when eta is not that small, then the behavior of this product matrix will be very different from this one. Okay, so that's the reason why HGD and GD should be uh, differentiated uh, in a moderate learning rate regime. And in phase one, uh, moderate learning rate will fit data with a small norm because for data with a large norm, uh, this will be greater than two. Uh, uh, from the power uh, method point of view, if it is greater than two, then that uh, iterate will that iteration will diverge. Okay. And in phase two, uh, when you annul the learning rate, when you decrease eta, then uh, the stochastic gradient will start to fit data with a large norm. Even for example, this is greater than two, but if you uh, reduce eta, then you can still make this term less than two, okay? Then uh, our method will uh, take effect, okay? Of course, uh, we just assume that uh, after one uh, learning rate decay, we can uh, successfully fit all the data points. But in practice, uh, maybe there are uh, some data points with a very large norm, even you after uh, do learning rate, uh, rate decay once, you still cannot fit those data points. Then you can do learning rate again. So in other words, uh, this uh, phase one, phase two can be extended to phase three, phase four uh, at, uh, uh, at your uh, discretion because uh, it depends on the data. You may need to do more than one uh, uh, learning rate decay, uh, more than once, okay. All right. So we also have some experiment to support our uh, theoretical analysis. So we basically plot this really quotient. Okay, this, this is uh, 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 this experiment is used to to verify that uh, our uh, convergence analysis is indeed correct. Okay, so I got uh, okay, okay. So thank you, uh, Misha. Uh, uh, talk to you later. So uh, for this one. Uh, basically, we show that uh, indeed uh, HGD and GD, uh, for HGD with a moderate learning rate, it will convert it to some large really quotient. But for GD with a small learning rate, or for GD with both a small and a moderate learning rate, they will convert it to some uh, uh, small uh, really quotient. And we have done experiments on the new network as well. Even though our theory does not cover this case, we still can uh, do a similar plot. The only difference is uh, in uh, deep learning, first of all, we don't know W star, we don't know uh, ground truth uh, weight vector. So can, we can use the gradient to approximate W minus W star because when W is close to W star, uh, it will align with the gradient uh, direction, okay? And uh, the second uh, difference is uh, 
in deep learning, the hashing actually is a time varying because it depends on W. At different W have different hashing. So we use uh, the spectral norm of hashing to normalize it. Okay. And you can see that uh, again, HGD with moderate learning rate will converge to some uh, large uh, really quotient, while HGD with a small learning rate and the GD with both a small and moderate learning rate will converge to uh, some uh, small uh, really quotient uh, direction. Okay. So uh, we have uh, answered this question. Uh, HD converge to some solution along a uh, eigenvalue uh, 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 direction. And uh, there's another question we haven't uh, answered. So how does this implicit bias affect the generalization uh, performance? Okay. So uh, regarding question, actually, given our implicit bias result, is uh, this question is uh, uh, not that difficult to answer. So we just do access risk decomposition. We decompose the last risk as uh, the estimation error and uh, the approximation error. The approximation error is agnostic to the algorithm, so it's just uh, uh, leave it there. The estimation error uh, is more interesting, and uh, we will show how the estimation error differs for GD and SGD. Uh, with moderate uh, rate. And uh, at the beginning of my talk, I said that uh, in our setting, we also consider early stopping. So in other words, we are not going to train the, uh, the object to optimize the object function to run a GD and GD forever until it hit the exact global minimum. So we will do early stopping. We will stop at some alpha level size, okay? So which is defined as a W of alpha. So the training loss equal to alpha. So then we stop, okay? And uh, the theory, the main result of the generalization performance is uh, for SGD with moderate learning rate, the estimation error is at the most delta alpha star. So remember that delta alpha star is defined as uh, the minimum uh, estimation attained at the alpha level set. Okay. But for uh, GD with moderate learning rate or small learning rate, uh, the estimation error will be at least kappa times uh, delta alpha star. So remember that this kappa is the condition number of the data covariance, the sub covariance matrix. Okay, so there's a correlation between the estimation error of SGD with moderate learning rate and the generalization error of GD with moderate and small uh, learning rate. And for G SGD with a small learning rate, actually uh, the estimation error will be identical, uh, will be in the same order of the uh, estimation error of GD. Okay. So the proof idea actually is a very, very uh, simple. So oh, remember that uh, for our empirical risk, it is uh, this concentric uh, ellipsoid, okay? And the uh, SGD converge along this direction, GD converge along this direction. But for the population risk, the covariance matrix is astropic. So the population risk will do the contour, contour part. Actually, it is a concentric circle, okay? Then if you do early stopping, you stop at the same empirical risk uh, level set, for example, you stop here. HGD actually is a uh, HGD actually stop here, and the GD will uh, stop here. But the distance between HGD to the global minimum and distance between HG, uh, GD to the global minimum actually different. They are at a different uh, uh, concentric circles. In fact, HGD when it stops at the, for example, alpha and pickle risk uh, level set, it will stay uh, inside. Uh, concentric circle, but for GD, actually it will stop at the uh, outer side uh, concentric circle. The outer side the concentric circle will have a larger uh, test error. So this is the proof idea of uh, uh, the, uh, the separation of the trans error for SGD and GD. Okay, so now we answer the, uh, the second question. So with the same level set of empirical risk, Converging from the larger eigenvalue direction will lead to a smaller population uh, risk. Okay, so uh, let me uh, wrap up the talk very quickly. So the takeaway is that AED and GD, they, exit, they exhibit a different directional bias when using a moderate learning rate. That's why it's important to study moderate learning rate for HGD and GD. And uh, in detail, HGD converge along a large eigenvalue direction while GD converge along small eigenvalue direction, okay? And when you apply early stopping, the convergence around large eigenvalue direction will lead to better generalization performance. Okay, so in the future, you can extend this result of, uh, to general data diffusion.
for example, mixture of Gaussians or sub Gaussians. You can also compare SGD with explicit regularization, such as a rigid regression or L2 regularized empirical risk minimization. And you can also uh, think about how to uh, extend the result uh, to other learning problems, such as logistic regression and human uh, work. That would be ideal. Okay. So, with that, uh, I will uh, stop here and uh, thank you uh, for your attending. I'm happy to take more questions. Thank you, Chen Chen. Uh, any questions? I do have a question earlier, especially from uh, mathematics. Um, great talk, by the way. I really, really liked it. Um, thank you. So, for SGD, I want to make sure because I feel like I must have said it earlier on, but I missed it. So, do you go through the observation once, and that's one epoch? Oh, okay, yeah. That, that, I, I, so your question you, is uh, about the proof idea. So in practice, uh, when we run SGD, just at each iteration, we sample a data point or sample a mini batch of data point. We calculate the, uh, the stochastic gradient over this mini batch uh, data point. So there's no guarantee that, uh, for example, every n iterations we are able to uh, use every single chain data point. There's no such guarantee. So here we just, uh, uh, for the simplicity of the analysis, we assume the SGD is performed in an epoch way. So at every epoch, we first shuffle chain data set. And then we just uh, uh, follow the ordering of the shuffled chain data, uh, chain data set to calculate uh, the uh, stochastic gradient uh, based on each uh, chain data point. And we do uh, stochastic gradient descent. And after we uh, go over this one epoch, we will re reshuffle the chain data point to get another uh, ordering of the entire uh, chain data point, entire chain data set, and do this uh, repeatedly. Yeah. And when you do annealing, uh, you just don't change the learning rate when you go through one epoch, right? Uh, we seen the epoch, we don't do uh, learning rate annealing, but the uh, epoch between epoch and epoch. For example, after a certain number of epochs, we found that we need to do a uh, learning rate annealing, and then we just uh, uh, divide the learning rate by, for example, 10 or something like that. And then we keep uh, doing the same thing. Yeah. Got it, okay. So I have a few questions. One, one of them is, how do you expect doing it in batches to change things? Oh. So, so like, you know, batch size, which should probably play a role because the batch size essentially is some sort of interpolation between SGD and just GD, right? So this, is, this is like, if you know, if you, so I wonder if you've looked into that. Yes, yes, we, we do. We, we do have, uh, uh, we do consider the, the, mini, the effect of the mini batch size in the, uh, in the paper. But in this oh. talk, uh, for simplicity, I just assume uh, mini batch size equal to one. Uh, for the ease of uh, uh, illustration. Yeah, so the mini batch size actually will uh, affect the, the structure of this, uh, this, this guy. So this is a product of a, a rank one matrix. But if we are doing a mini batch SGD, then it will be a product of, a, 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 sorry, this is not rank one, this is identity minus rank one. But if we are doing a mini batch, uh, this matrix will be become identity minus, uh, for example, rank B matrix. So basically mm -hmm. sum of a B rank one matrix. And uh, in the uh, proof, we need to use some random matrix theory uh, tools to, uh, to bound uh, this product. So if there's a mini batch, then definitely there will be another uh, layer of uh, uh, concentration uh, happening there because if you do averaging, then is you have a concentration effect. So that can be uh, carefully uh, analyzed uh, in the random matrix theory uh, proof part. Yeah, but uh, uh, for simplicity, I just assume uh, batch size equal to one. And this and what is, is the, uh, what is the what is the uh, takeaway message when uh, using batches? Do, do you have like do they approach the minimum uh, in from the direction that's sort of in between or? Yeah, so that mini batch will affect uh, the the interval the 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 the, the ending point of the end point of this interval. Uh, okay, so like the, it's 
it's either one or the other. There's no interpolation, but then there's it, it affects when the cutoff make that, makes that makes a transition happen, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't it will affect the, the cutoff, yes. Because okay. in the extreme case, when B go to so imagine that you so roughly speaking, maybe you have a B in the uh, denominator here because when B equal to N, then uh, this actually reduced to like uh, uh, oh, sorry, this is GD. Uh, I, uh, I I said something wrong. Uh, I, I think that it will affect uh, uh, something here. For example, it's a two B divided by lambda one. This is two B divided by lambda two. So when yeah, B uh, to N, then it will uh, become this guy. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. No problem.